I want to talk about the name of Jesus. And, um, and to talk about the name of Jesus, we need to go to the Old Testament. We already seen in the Old Testament that the word heaven, hasha ma'im, is the Hebrew word for heaven. I'm going to try to pull these up very, very quickly. Nobody believes me that I'm going to do this very quickly. Um, when you look at Genesis 1 and 1, again, hasha ma'im is the word for heaven. And so the word heaven, Hashemayim, um, I want to draw a little bit. It's right here. Hashemayim. Again, Hashem. Hashem in Hebrew, Shem means name. Hashem is the name. Hey in front is the. If you remove Shem, the Hebrew word for name, Shem, right there, Shem. If you remove Shem, you don't have heaven. But Hebrew is built off of root words. To have heaven, you have to have the name. Let's go to another passage of scripture. And um, we're going to go to Deuteronomy 15, verse number 2. Deuteronomy 15, verse number 2. Here's another word that is a feeps, those who have tuned in before, a figure, example, example, pattern, shadow of New Testament. This word that I want to look at is right here, called the release. In the Old Testament, um, in order for an individual that was in bondage to uh, be free, they had to have a release. This word release is hasha mita. And again, what do you see? You see this hashem. And hashem again, Terry, means what? The name. The name. Old Testament is pictures, it paints. Hasha mita, there is next this letter. Tet. Tet, Terry was a picture originally of a serpent or a snake. Serpent or a snake. And these are on our website. And so I'm drawing that serpent or the snake. The last letter is the letter hey, which at the end of a word means what? It what what comes from. What comes from. And so now you have this word hashamita which means the release. Um, in God's picture in the Old Testament of being released or being set free was what comes from the name applied to what? That snake or serpent. That snake or serpent. And so God was setting forth a picture that in order for you to be free, it was going to be based on the name being applied to that old snake, that old devil, that old serpent that was in the garden. If you're going to be set free, you have to have the name called. And I want to come back to that, or I may just go down that street now. I want to come back to that in just a moment. Uh, another word um, that has the name in it 
is in Exodus 48, verse 35. And Terry, uh, if you beat me there, go ahead and read it for me. Exodus 48, verse number 35. Exodus 48. Last verse in the Exodus, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Got it? Okay. No problem. All right. Uh, for the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and fire was on it by night, in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Is that what you wanted? Keep reading. That was in there. I was in Exodus 40. My fault. I met Ezekiel. Oh, no problem. Yeah. Let's get, I'll get there. Yeah. There we go. Ezekiel. You read it. Very last verse, Ezekiel 48, 35. That's it. It was, it was round about 18,000 measures, and the name of the city from that day shall be, the Lord is there. Okay. So, so we're going to talk about the name of Jesus here in a moment. Leading into that, we're looking at the Old Testament words that had the name doctrine in it, or what God viewed the name for. Now here, this word there is shama. You see a lot of, hear a lot of people speak in tongues in a lot of different churches, and that's a common Hebrew word that they say in tongues, shama, shama. And shama, again, is Hebrew for there. Um, when we look at this word, Shema, Shema, Shinimim, again, is what? Name. Name. Hey, again, at the end of a Hebrew word speaks of? What comes from. What comes from. Let me see if I can share my screen. So there, God's there, is what comes from his name. How does that make sense? I'm going to stay on this page, Terry. I want you to get Matthew 18, verse number 20. Verse 24, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. So, so Jesus says in the New Testament, if you gather together in my name, then I am there. The way that you get Jesus there, wherever there is, is you have to be calling his name there. Because calling his name is what causes him to transport to wherever you are. Now, I'm reminded of 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Um, in chapter 7, verse 14, is a scripture that all of us are familiar with. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. And Tara, I want you to turn there. Uh, with me as well. If my people, which are called by my name, mm -hmm. shall humble themselves and pray mm -hmm. and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Read. Now mine eyes shall be open and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. Mm -hmm. Read. For now have I chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever. And uh -huh. mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. So, so look at this. We read 2 Chronicles 7 and 14, my people that are called by my name. But when you read 2 Chronicles chapter number 6, the whole reason, the whole reason, to build the tabernacle was to have a place 
where God was going to be at. And Solomon kept saying, I'm building this for his name. I want his name to be there because there equates to his name. When we go further down in 2 Chronicles chapter number 7, in the verse that you just read, verse number 16, um, here is the word there, and I hope um, it's going to allow me to draw right here. Here's the word there. Can you see that? Where I yes, sir. Mm -hmm. The word there, again, is made up of two Hebrew letters, Shin and Mim, which again is the root or the origin of this word is the word what? Name. And so it's Strong's 8033, God's picture of there. I go to Strong's 8033. I'm going to pull it up. And it says here, Sham, a particle rather from the relative pronoun 834, which it means 8034. That's a mistake on there, which is below, right below it, Shem, which again is the mark or memorial or individuality. And Shem means, like it does right here, name, name. God's there. And Terry, um, I want you to say that with me. God's there. God's there. Is God's name. Is God's name. Yeah. And, and, and uh, literally, when you spell the word name, you're spelling the word there. God is where his name is at. Hence, when you baptize somebody, if they want God to be there in their life, it's essential that you call their name. Let's take it a step further. I want to go to Deuteronomy 6 and 4. And then we're going to come back, and I want to talk about Jesus' purpose and why Jesus' name. Deuteronomy 6 and 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Pull up the interlinear dictionary. The word here, again, is the word shama, shama, shin, mem, and shin and mem spell what? Name. Uh-huh. Ayan, this time, is the last letter in this word. And ayan at the end speaks of what? An I experience. Exactly. And so you've got the word here in Hebrew, and the most important verse in the Old Testament. Jesus, when he was asked what's the greatest commandment, he said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. But the word here is made up of the word Shem, which means name, plus Ion, which means an experience. And so God's word here speaks of having an experience with his name. Um, JL. JL is, uh, is handling uh, some of the interaction with the folks that are listening. Uh, Danielle. Danielle is handling the interaction with some of our listeners, our viewers, the ones who are tuned into this webinar. You can believe that they were doing something else before I called their name. But when I say, Terry, yep. you can be in a room with a thousand people. And uh, I can call a certain person's name. And when I call their name, all of a sudden, there's an interaction between me and them. And God works like that. And that's how he orchestrated it. Some folks might wonder, well, why is it important to call his name? It's important to call his name because when you call his name, you have an experience with him. You get God's attention 
when you call his name. And if you don't call his name, you're not going to have that experience with him that he wants to have, nor will he be there. And I'll go one more step. Even the word rain is the word geshem. It means that when you lift up his name, uh, gimel in Hebrew means to lift up, a camel, lifting up. And when you lift up his name, that's when the rain from heaven comes down. Hence, Jeremiah 14, 2 talks about he does stuff for his name's sake. And then the next verse talks about him sending rain. He sends rain when you call his name. All of that is awesome. God sends a release. Whatever has you bound, the devil has to get off of you when you call his name, the release. God is there when you call his name. Uh, God sends rain when you call his name. You got to call his name to have heaven. And uh, I could go down a whole list of other stuff, but the most important thing ever in your life is that the word Jesus is his only, in the New Testament now is where we're at, is his only saving name. It's his only saving name. Let's go back very quickly to the book of Matthew. Terry, I want you to go there with me. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to ask you, my brother, to... Um, to read Matthew 1, verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Okay. I would be remiss to talk to you about the name of Jesus and not talk to you about the name of Jesus saving you from your sins to talk about the word sin. This is the most important subject, I believe, for any Christian, because he came as Jesus to save you from your sins. Whenever you talk about salvation, it's always one of two things, to save somebody to life or to save them from their trouble. Every instance in the Bible, save is to either save you from your trouble or to save you to life. That's in the book, uh, Born of Water, in detail. Now, when we look at sin, and this is why Jesus came, and we're going to show you uh, how his name even does this. But the first thing I want you to do, I want you to um, go to the first use of sin. The way I'm going to find it, the way I'm going to find it is I'm going to use my tool, type sin in PC Study Bible, like you can do in, in um, Blue Letter Bible, and I'm going to search for the word sin. The first time sin is used, Terry, is where? Genesis 4, verse 7. Genesis 4, 7. If I had the time tonight, which I don't, that word kata the word for sin that we're going to, in the Hebrew Bible, kata in the Hebrew is used 474 times. Um, 474 is a 47 palindrome. 474 is 474747 The reason why I mentioned is a mnemonic because I want you to understand the first time sin is used is in Genesis 4 and 7, and it's used 474 times. As we go along and talk about the name next week, and I'm going to start out on the name, you will see why even those numbers keep coming up, keep coming up, keep coming up. But first of all, Genesis 4 and 7. Let's go to that passage. Read for me, Terry. What does God say to Cain? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. Mm -hmm. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Okay. So, first of all, he tells Cain, if you do well, you'll be accepted. 
Cain not only had hope, but God puts a mark on him. It's not part of tonight's lesson. But God puts a mark on Cain, and that mark was significant. He tells him, if you do well, you'll be accepted. If you don't do well, he said, what happens, Terry? Sin liar. At the door. At the door, and unto thee shall be his desire. Uh-huh. And thou shalt rule over him. Okay, I'm going to start drawing here in just a moment. But Jesus comes to save us from our sins, our sins. And when you look at sin, a lot of people look at sin just one way, and they think that they're inclined to sin, that they have a desire to commit that sin. But what they fail to realize that in the first use of the word sin, it was not that Cain was attracted to sin, but it was that sin was attracted to Cain. I think I'll let that sink in for a second. He tells Cain, if you do well, you'll be accepted, but if you don't do well, sin is at the door, and its desire, his desire, is to thee. Unto thee shall be sin's desire. What that's saying is that sin is after you. Sin wants to get you. If you're not in the place, we're going to talk about grace, that you should be in, then sin is ready to pounce on you like a lion. It desires to have you. One thing about sin also, before I start drawing, breaking this down, we see in Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2. Ah, let me share my screen. Terry, get Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run this race. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, mm -hmm. looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who yeah. for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Okay. Now, again, we're going to talk a bit more about the name of Jesus. But before we do, the Hebrew writer tells us uh, that we're compassed about with this great cloud of witnesses. Because of that, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. This word does so easily beset us. Terry, I want you to tell me if you can see this. Yes, yeah? sir. I can see. Yep. Okay. Yes, sir. It is the word upper istaton. This Greek word Uperistaton or who for istaton. This word, it says from 29, 2095, derived from a presumed compound. And what it literally means is right here. I want you to read it for me, bro. It well, is that, well standing around. Uh-huh. Keep on going. A competitor, thwarting, uh -huh. a racer in every direction, figuratively figuratively of sin and genitive case. Okay, and so the word uh, for does so easily beset us, it is a word which means well standing around in every direction. It is standing around in every direction. And uh, I'll go a step further, and it has the article with this. It, it says the sin that does so easily beset us and what that means that every person has a sin. Most people are not fighting with 20,000 sins. Most people are fighting with one sin. And he said that sin does so easily beset us, that doesn't mean that it causes us to fall. It means that it's well standing around, everywhere around us, that one sin is always within our reach. That uh, we are always, if we get sideways, we are always in a position where that sin is going to pounce on us. Not we're going to go after it, 
But if we get out of God's will, that sin is going to jump on us. Because the Bible says his desire, sin's desire, is to us. Um, I, I, I like to describe it like this. Uh, if you ever seen or you had a magnet on the table, and if this was a magnet right here, put it to where you can see it, and this is the table, and I had some iron filings or some nails here, and I start moving that magnet, everywhere I move this, everywhere I move this, on this side, um, those filings are moving. Uh, if this was me, and I'm magnetic, and I move this on my hand, and I have iron filings over here, Terry, everywhere I move this, they're moving. The only thing that's keeping what's on this side of the hand from jumping on me is that there's something between us. Are you with me? Oh, yes. Okay. And so here I am moving, and everywhere I move within the circle, everywhere I move, those things are attracted to me. In, in a, but there's something that is keeping that thing, that sin, from getting me again. But he says, uh, if you do well, you'll be accepted. But if you don't, sin is right here at the door. And what happens is when I don't do well, I open up the door for that sin that wants to jump on me and is always within reach of jumping on me. I open up the door for it to pounce and get me like a lion. Are you with me? Oh, yeah. And, and, and that's why, that's why, though, that Jesus came. Because Jesus knew that sin had an attraction towards man where it was always going to keep jumping on us and keep on pouncing on us. And he says, hold up. Uh, I don't like the way it's set up right now. Because right now we have atonement. And yes. atonement only means that you're going to cover. The word atonement from the word kafar, it means a covering. And so here you are walking around and sin is jumping on you, but then you get coated over so you don't see the sin. And Jesus says, mm -mm. God says, mm -mm. I'm going to fix this once and for all. The way that you get a name uh, was for one of four ways. You either got a name based on patronymical, again, that means that you were somebody's son. So some people out there are named Johnson, Stevenson. They got it from their father, their name. Some folks get their name based on the location. Uh, again, Rivers, Hill. Uh, some people get their name based on their occupation. They're a cook. Uh, they're a smith. Some people get their name based on characteristics, whether they're tall or short. Uh, and so here you get your name based on something associated with you. And the Bible says he's going to come. His name is not going to be Elohim. He's not going to come taking the name Adonai. He's going to come, and he's not going to come taking the name Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, the Jehovah Roi, but he's going to come, and he's going to take the name of Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And again, Terry's sin is always at the door, and it's always real close within reach, and the only thing we have to do, for, had to do for sin to pounce on us and get control of us was for us to just do a little wrong, step a little to the left or to the right, and then sin had us. Um, how much time do we have? Because I'm just getting started on this. So the name of Jesus, one more time, I want to draw the picture. Go to the Hebrew pictograph. The name Jesus, Terry, can you see me? 
Yod, Shisha, yes, mm -hmm. Ba, and Ayan. I'm going to emphasize three of them. In the Hebrew, this is the name Yeshua. This is not what it called him in the New Testament Greek. It called him Jesus. Um, you call this name in your language. We've already dealt with that, I think, on the first class. But what you see is that the components of his name, the first one, Yod, was originally a picture of an arm in a hand. Second one, this was originally a picture of two teeth. The last one, iron, speaks of an experience. And the Bible said, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. When Jesus came with his arm, this letter Yod is also translated in our Bible power. And the Bible said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he is the wisdom of God and the power of God. So he came bearing this name so that he could get sin off of us for good. Off of us for good. That means, Terry, if, if, um, if you're walking around magnetic, everything that's iron is going to pounce on you. And can you imagine walking around on the earth and you're a magnet? Can you imagine how much stuff would have uh, be joined to you? But that's what it was like when man was walking around and sin had an attraction to him. There was so much sin that the Bible says that sin abounded. It was just more and more and more that got on him. And God says, I'm going to save you from your sin. I have the power to do it. And so therefore, with my own arm, I'm going to bring salvation. And then the Bible says he comes. And he didn't come to bring peace. The Bible said he came uh, to bring a sword. And this letter, Shin, depicts that he when he came, he was going to come destroying stuff, and he destroyed sin in his body. And then I speaks of an experience. And uh, he came so that everyone could have this experience of being delivered from sin. Let's go back. And I'm going to talk about something else here for just a few moments, recognizing that time is short. When we look at um, a sin, oh Lord, we have to stay on for a little while longer tonight. Because I'm going to go back to this um, Genesis 4 and 7, the word for sin is the Hebrew word kata. I want to bring it up so the audience can see what sin, what sin is what sin looks like. Genesis 4 and 7. Jesus came to save us from our sin. What does sin look like? Genesis 4, verse number 7. If you see the word sin, it's right here. This word sin, katat, here it is a noun, sin. When you pull up Strong's, it is three letters, kata. The first letter, come on, Terry, talk to me. The letter, cat, cat which was originally a picture of a? Fence. A fence. These are on our website. The second letter, the picture of a serpent or snake, tet. Yes, yeah, the tet, which was a picture of a serpent. This is God's picture of sin. The next letter is the letter aleph, which was a picture of a ox. Ox, which speaks of one of two things. It speaks of strength. 
And it also speaks of I, me. So when you look at sin, God's picture of sin, I'm going to try to go back to the whiteboard. Sin was a picture of offense. And I'm going to just draw it like this. Something that surrounds, that harmonizes with Hebrew 12 and 1. Not only sin surrounds, but then sin is also a picture of a serpent. And then sin is a picture of Aleph, which represents strength. And um, so sin is something that surrounds me. And uh, sin is something of a serpent that depicts the serpent surrounding, and not only surrounding, but surrounding in strength. And like a serpent, it can squeeze me, and it can kill me, and it can get me in his grips, where the serpent can get me in his grips, and the serpent gets me in his grips, and he surrounds me, and he just keeps squeezing and he just keeps squeezing, and he just keeps squeezing until I am dead. Oh, but Jesus says, I come to give you life. I know we're going to be out of time. How much time are we out of? <laughs> we are way out of time. Um. I want to talk for just a few more moments now. I want to go just a few more moments and so that we pick up on this next week. When we look at the name of Jesus, the purpose of it is primarily one thing, to save us from what? From our sins. From our sins. Sin is something that you have a picture of a serpent and you have you in this surrounding, and then that serpent goes to work on you with his strength of killing you and destroying you. But Jesus comes, and he says, I'm going to loose you from that, and he puts us in another place, and that place is called grace. And here is grace. It's just two letters, Cain. Nun, which was a picture of a seed. Ket, which is a picture of a fence. And we're going to get back to the name of Jesus and how this works on next week. But you have sin. And you have the serpent working within this sinful world. And then he comes and he brings grace, which is another fence. And right inside of this world, you have this, another fence. And a picture of a seed or life, this is the picture of grace, life inside of a fence. And so in a world of sin, he forms another circle and he puts us in that. And here we are walking around in a world of sin, and we're in a place called, a place called grace, a place where we are saved that sin cannot get into. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. God does not allow sin in here because Jesus saved us from our sins. We'll pick it up on next week. Um, Terry, lead us in prayer. Lord, we thank you, God, for your word that is went forth. God, we thank you for the understanding of your name. And God, we know that if we call your name, God, you'll be there. God, if we call your name, God, we can get the release, God, from any uh, sin, God, that we have on us. God, you are able. And God, even just a part of your name, God, the strength 
and God, your ability, God, to save us from our sins. God, help us never, God, to sell yourself short, God. Father, don't let us think that this sin can just overtake us. And God, that you can't help, but God, your name is stronger. And God, we can call on you, God, and get all that we need in your name, God. There's everything that we need, and we will trust you on today. And it's in your name we pray, in Jesus' name. In join, Jesus. Us join us next week. You'll see, how, you'll see how all of this ties back to the Christ and the anointing and the purpose that God has for your life. God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. In Jesus' name, amen.